Oh, wow. So there's sort of three key uh, points at which an entrepreneur, any business should really start uh, making sure they have a lawyer. Uh, initially, as they're getting set up, making sure that they have all the policies and procedures in place to avoid problems later on. And this goes from everything to, um, uh, to est establishing uh, equity positions, to creating uh, policies and procedures to protect you know, assets, whether it be intellectual property or uh, actual physical assets. Uh, and uh, of course, anytime you want to, you're, you're getting into the governance of, of a business, right? You need to make sure you have, uh, for example, in, in uh, United States, in Michigan in particular, limited liability companies are the primary uh, business form taken by startups and frequently you have people who are close and they've worked with each other and there's two of them and when they enter into agreement they have absolutely uh, nothing in place about about what to do if one of them should pass away or one of them enter bankruptcy or if uh, they just can't agree what's going to be the tiebreaker so uh, when you set things up is you know, really one of the points where you should make sure you have an attorney involved. Uh, the next point is when you're taking on uh, investors, right? I think a lot of entrepreneurs have have a, um, a slightly uh, slanted idea about how much of their company they are going to own uh, if they take on uh, investors. And so when you start looking at, you know, your tables and who owns what and, you know, whether you're dealing with convertible notes or whatever, anytime you're taking money from someone else, you need to have a lawyer involved because typically they are going to have a lawyer involved and you want to make sure that you have somebody who knows the business and they understand these kinds of transaction look, transactions looking for it. And uh, then Anytime, the, the third category would probably be anytime you're interacting with somebody who isn't, you know, sort of part of the company, whether that be customers or whether that be employees, right? So most businesses, whether they recognize it or not, have uh, intellectual property that they're using or uh, that they're licensing to other people or that they're creating and they need to make sure that they own it, right? The company owns it, not necessarily the individual who created it. And if you don't take steps, frequently that's the default position. Uh, and anytime you're interact interacting with customers, uh, you, you need to make sure that, you know, the interaction is the way you want it to be. And particularly if you're providing um, goods or services to the public, you're not going to encounter uh, unexpected liability, right? That you're uh, make, and I don't necessarily mean just somebody slipping and falling, but we're talking about everything from, you know, you're giving a customer uh, a, a, a piece of, of work product that actually violates someone else's intellectual property rights, for example, mm -hmm. right? Something you, 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 you weren't thinking about that, but oh yeah, you just sold them. And so now they're in the position where they're infringing. So uh, there are a couple of key points, but you do, you, you really should have a lawyer when these uh, fairly typical things kind of roll around. I tell people, you're going to pay a lawyer. The question is whether you're going to pay me a little bit up front or pay lots of lawyers a lot on the back end. That's just kind of the nature of the business. Of business, in fact. <laughs> when I left my corporate role, I had to set up my business in Australia. And I'd been given good advice, go and seek out a lawyer. Before you even start, before you put any pen to paper, money down, go and talk to the lawyer. And I spoke to the lawyer and he showed me what to do. And what I realised for me was he made the process very simple. Do A, do B, do C, don't try to do D at all, <laughs> just send that back to me and then we'll take care of the other things. And that gave me a lot of peace of mind. A few years after that, I decided I wanted to buy a business 
and I wanted to buy a franchise. And when I saw the franchise agreement, I opened it up and I flicked from page to page and not one of those words made sense. And I looked at it and my brain right. did a brain fart and went... <laughs> and it switched off. And so I reached out to the lawyer and I said, can you read this? And it was interesting, the way he turned through the contract, the specific places that he looked at, the pages and the conditions and the appendixes and the meanings, he brought so much clarity just in that one hour. And he took his pen out and said, don't sign this, don't sign this, don't sign that. You need to renegotiate all of that. And these are the consequences. And so quickly within an hour, he took me from where I was today, 2016, all the way out to 2023. And he said, you've got to be thinking about seven years down the track when it's time for you to exit. And this is what you need to know today. Because if you're not thinking about that, you're going to get trapped seven years from now. And he was right. And so for me, <laughs> when I bought the business, I used him. And then when I had to exit the franchise, I called him up and I said, remember all those things you told me? He said, did the chickens come home to roost? And I said, absolutely, just a little bit sooner than I expected. <laughs> and he said, perfect. Well, it's been set up for success. And that was a lot of peace of mind for me. But one of the things I do see, people keep asking the wrong people for advice. They ask their uncles, hey, uncle, what do you think about this? And uncle gives them some uneducated opinion and it ends up being wrong. So if... A consumer is looking at services from a lawyer. How should they evaluate the return on investment? When they look at this purchase, they look at this service, how do they evaluate the return on the time and the money invested in the service? Right. So choosing an attorney is like, you know, using a very American analogy, uh, choosing a therapist, right? It has to be somebody that you feel comfortable with, comfortable with, not just somebody who you recognize has the expertise that you want, but also somebody who you feel will listen to you and prioritize uh, what your objectives are, right? So when you start evaluating, you know, first you have to identify a good lawyer, but once you've done that, if you're gonna look at, you know, sort of ROI on this, you have to consider worst case scenario, right? You go to buy a business and you don't have a lawyer with you. And one of the, and you think, okay, hey, I saved, you know, five, 10 grand. But what you ended up doing was taking on a business that had, you know, liabilities you weren't aware of and didn't know to look for. And those liabilities far, you know, exceed whatever the legal fees might have been. You forego a lawyer when you're, you know, creating the infrastructure for your company. And the next thing you know, you, you know, your partner dies and you're saddled with having the deal. You're not able to buy their interest out and suddenly you're saddled with, you know, uh, their spouse uh, who inherits their interest in the company, right? There are, uh, are so many things that could go wrong. And a good lawyer is someone who's going to be looking at how can you avoid the worst case scenarios. So if you want to figure out what your ROI is, look at the expense of a worst case scenario and compare that to the cost of a lawyer. Uh, I've seen so many promising businesses, you know, go under because they made what were, you know, in retrospect, really avoidable mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, infringing on someone else's intellectual property, um, not making sure that one of their most valuable employees wasn't able to go and take, you know, so much of the proprietary information with them. I mean, everything from, you know, NDAs to non-competes, uh, finding out that they actually don't own intellectual property that they created, right, that was created by their company. Things that could have, with you know, three or four pieces of paper, been prevented, right? So the, uh, it's it's usually very much worth your while to have somebody who knows it, who's you know, have a lawyer with you when you're doing these things. I'd been thinking about it. How do I get a return on the investment in my lawyer? 
And I broke it up into two key areas. There was the non-financials and there was also the financials. And so the non-financial for me was the risk reduction, exactly what you're saying here. The ability to remove the risk, even to the point of saying, don't make this decision. And that could have saved so much time. Also, I found that with my lawyer, he helps me make very good decisions because he asks me questions that I can't consider from my perspective. I'm the entrepreneur. I want to get in there. I want to make sales. I want to make money. I want to make somebody's day. And so my bias is towards the human bias. But I found that my lawyer is very uh, systemic. So he doesn't have a people bias. He wants to look at the system, the law, and he will guide me through that. And that's really nice because when I grew up, I had a learning disability. And the learning disability was a linear sequential learning disability. And so when you read through a contract, it's in a lineal fashion. 0.1, 0.1, 0.2, 0.1, 0.3, 1.4. So he's guided me through it systematically. And that was a real help. But finally, I think for me, the biggest non-financial takeaway is the peace of mind. That once I signed that contract, I knew that I was safe and secure. There was no risk to mum or dad. There was no risk to my wife and no risk to my children. And even if something did go wrong, I still slept straight at night because I had that peace of mind. And so when I look at it, I'd say that's the non-financials. But the financials, how do I get a return on it? When I wanted to exit a business, it was the speed. It happened so fast. And something that could have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, I got out for tens of thousands. And so I saved a lot of money at the exit. Also negotiating on the terms. He said, Daniel, we can break all of this down. You can't negotiate on that, but you can negotiate here. This is what you should be asking for. This is what you should be accepting. This is what you should be saying. And so in the exits, in the negotiations, I saved tens of thousands of dollars, but I also got 30 years of his experience in three hours. It was like going to university for a decade, <laughs> having 20 years worth of clients and downloading it for th- in three hours. And I was like, oh my gosh, I actually know how to act correctly now to get can in, I, can I, to get out of the deal. Can, can I make a point? What, you, what you're saying is actually very, very important. And that is you want a lawyer who has experience with the particular matter, right? You wouldn't go to, you know, a podiatrist for brain surgery. And the truth is lawyers tend to be very, very specialized. Uh, Business lawyers, you know, lawyers that handle transactions are very different from lawyers that handle litigation. And one of the reasons they're able to give you that peace of mind, and one of the reasons they're able to explain it to you is because they've seen it before, right? They're keeping Mm up on, you know, sort of current developments. Lawyers are required to do that. But they've, you know, they've negotiated you know, these kind of contracts for 30 years, they know where they where there's room to negotiate and they know where there isn't. And it doesn't make sense to negotiate a point that, you know, 20 years of experience have told them, you know, you're not going to get much movement there. And that's why they're able to read those read that contract the way they did. Right. They know the truth is, you know, most contracts are essentially boilerplate, but there are always a few key provisions, a few key definitions that you have to pay particular attention to, right? And so those are some of the, those are places you go first. You read the whole contract, but you go to those places first and you know that from experience. And so finding a lawyer who is experienced in the, t- in the subject matter uh, that you're dealing with is just as important as, you know, filing a, a, a lawyer at all. Mm-hmm. I think about it and I tell people, if you're going to go to the lawyer, don't worry about the price. You're not paying them for their time. You're not paying them for the hour. You're paying them for the wisdom. And that one bit of advice could make you rich. But if you fail to get it, then you've got to accept all the risk. And there's people in and out of the courts all the time. Things that they could have solved for a couple of thousand dollars at the start could have kept them out of the courts for many, many years. And, I, and I've been to the courts and because I was stubborn, <laughs> I didn't want to get right. the advice. I thought I could do it myself, but you end up with a lot of egg on your face. 
And it's not so much the money. You can get the money back, but it's the time. And also, I, I think for my lawyer, it's like they wear the bulletproof vest for you. They take the bullets for you. You know, the other party, they want to assassinate your character. They want to rip you to shreds. And it hurts when they send those emotional bullets. But you just let the lawyer take it. And then you go about making money, staying focused on what you've got to do. And that, and that for me, is priceless. It's that peace of mind. <laughs> you deal with the aggressive people and let me smile. <laughs> we had fun with the kids. <laughs> I don't mind a little aggression. <laughs> well, it's part of my job. Well, I want an aggressive lawyer. I want one. I want one to get in the tank and uh, eat the other sharks alive. <laughs> now, out in the world today, uh, there's a lot of surveillance technologies. How do you balance the benefits of surveillance technologies and individuals' privacy rights? All right. So that's that's an, that's a really interesting question because it's very um, sort of fact specific. Right. When you think about sur- when you think about surveillance, I mean, you know, I've got a ring camera, right? That's, it's one thing to have your neighbors keeping an eye out for what's happening. It's one thing to have a private business, you know, sort of monitoring their own premises. It's very different when you are talking about the government, and that's any government, but let's stick with the U.S. for a while. Uh, talking about them monitoring their citizens particularly those who they don't have any reason to suspect have done anything wrong. And then when you look at what AI augmented surveillance can do these days, right? So we're talking not just being able to see people, being able to identify this person and tie them into every other government database that exists. So, you know, you read a license plate and you know who owns the car, how they voted, where they live, you know, you're able to, in, literally, you're able to track the person in that car by their clothes across the city using various cameras. And you think, what is the purpose of, of the government having this kind of information? And if it's very targeted, right, if you're looking at somebody who is independent of that surveillance, suspected of committing you know, of being a danger to society, that's one thing, but that's typically not how surveillance gets used. And in fact, when it comes to crime, surveillance in most instances is, you know, it's sort of, it's responsive to what happens. You can see what happened. It doesn't necessarily stop it. And study after study has shown that any uh, increase in public safety that accompanies uh, surveillance eventually wanes, right? And eventually people get used to being viewed. It doesn't change their behavior, but what it does do is enable the government to uh, keep an eye on citizens when they're not doing anything wrong, which is particularly problematic in a society, for example, in a city like Detroit, uh, which is where I am, which has been for decades a, um, a, a real hub for union activity for religious and ethnic minorities fighting for civil rights. And history has shown us, if nothing else, that the government will ultimately abuse this ability. In the United States, there are programs, COINTELPRO, the Ghetto Informant Program, the surveillance of Muslims in the aftermath of 9-11. In Baltimore, there were protests over the death of a, a black man named Freddie Gray in police custody. And the police use facial recognition software to identify protesters in the crowd who had outstanding warrants for things that weren't necessarily serious, right? You know, it could be anything from jaywalking to, you know, driving without insurance. And then weren't able to go out there in the crowd and arrest those people. You're talking about a chilling effect on, you know, sort of otherwise lawful protest. And that's problematic. Uh, The... And in America, most of our rights were, our rights to be secure in our persons and possession are predicated upon rules that were created long ago. We really don't have any guardrails to keep, um, to keep government surveillance, the kind we have now, in check. It used to be you knew the police couldn't watch everyone 
all the time, all at once, right? That's actually not true anymore. And we don't have rules to govern that kind of surveillance. We don't have the normal kind of constitutional protections uh, that we're accustomed to. And so, I mean, I personally think that the United States government should um, put a freeze on using AI in domestic surveillance until we get some rules in place to govern it. Because right now, it's very unregulated. And what you're doing is um, really chilling the, you know, the people when it comes to uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association, uh, the right to lawfully protest when things are wrong. Uh, and, in, and unless and in, unless we get a handle on it right now, I mean, there was recently a, uh, an executive order here in the United States uh, issued to sort of put some rules in place for the use of artificial intelligence, which is a, a big component of modern surveillance, uh, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. So until we begin to put those guardrails in place, we think we really ought to check it because this you can't you can't put this back in in the, in the jar once you've opened it